Okay, so uh, I'm going to review from the beginning uh, this introduction to hermeneutics. It's based on the test of hermeneutics and then um, hermeneutics and the critique of ideology, two essays by Paul Ricoeur, which can be found most recently published in this uh, volume, um, also available in an earlier volume by um, edited by uh, John Thompson. And um, both uh, the same, different pagination though, but you'll be able to follow what I'm doing by going by the outline here, which is, I've just lifted from um, it, the label parts, sections in record, and the other, I've just inserted uh, high points uh, for interpretation. Uh, I'm going to go, <clears throat> I'll come back to the opening uh, paragraphs here, uh, which really can only be understood after we finished uh, um, the essay as a whole, which illustrates a classic um, and basic hermeneutical principle, which is um, uh, one recognized already by Schleiermacher, which is to understand the, the parts of an essay, you have to understand the whole, but to understand the whole, you have to understand uh, the parts. And there, there's no point, uh, no place where you can begin. You need the one with the other. That's maybe the most basic version, uh, maybe the most familiar version of the, of the so-called hermeneutical circle. It's more of a spiral through time because as you go back forth from part to whole to part to whole, uh, you will bring together what the parts mean in conversation with the coherence of the whole, assuming there is coherence, um, to um, uh, solely arrive at, at, at um, um, an understanding where fewer and fewer anomalies um, um, pertain, uh, although there might still be certain parts which you say, well, that doesn't make sense, but it's still part of that overall dialectic and in a perfectly coherent uh, document. Eventually, the part in the whole uh, will cohere, and you will have been through that uh, hermeneutical process. Um, <clears throat> so let me start here with the first locus of interpretation. This is my third attempt, <clears throat> and now I'm going to cough my way <laughs> clearly through this. Um, I wonder if I should get, pause and get a, a drink. I'll see if I can uh, make it or not. But let me just start here with the number one and make these relatively short so they're easy to page through, um, and, and go with language, and then polysemy, or, and then discernment and interpretation. So the first locus of interpretation, uh, Ricor says, um, is, is language um, and the natural uh, to and fro of language between um, two people. Here's where I want to, and, and here you can, you know, so you have, a, you know, your two uh, people and this person has a, an idea that they want to say, they want to communicate, so the idea X, and then they uh, want to communicate it, so they say X, and this other person hears X, and, and you've had successful communication uh, when then this person thinks the X, the same X uh, that that person thinks. This is a, a, what, what they'll talk, talk about. he talks about in terms of an act of discourse uh, um, being uh, put into a language, um, and, um, a code system, and then the, the language then uh, coming to this point and then the person understanding the word according to the same uh, system of codes. Now, of course, sometimes um, because of, of polysemy, uh, there can be uh, confusion about what exactly is meant by a word, because a word uh, can mean uh, different things easily in different contexts. The same word can have very uh, many different re meanings. And in conversation, of course, if the person is not sure what X is, or if you've said X, you know, Y and Z, and those don't seem to go together, then this person can uh, inquire back and say X, Y, Z, and, and ask a question. And then you come back and you clarify X, Y, Z. And until, uh, again, in the, the end result is, is that you have understanding when this person understands by X, Y, Z, uh, what you thought when you thought X, um, Y, Z. That, that's the most fundamental sort of uh, picture and context um, of interpretation um, and, and, and a basic use of language to communicate, even within the face-to-face, -face, this, this sort of communication person-to-person -person conversation where you have a back and forth because of uh, the, the feature of language by which uh, words can have multiple meanings depending on their context, there's need for discernment and interpretation um, even at this point. But because of the back and forth, uh, that, that is um, uh, not guaranteed to happen, of course, but it's, it's uh, more likely to happen than not. Um, 
well, maybe not even that, but it's 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 ideal. That's where it's most likely to happen. Um, things get more complicated when you uh, the person thinks x and then um, writes the x down in a book. And so now you come along later and you're no longer in the same uh, place as this person. And so they've written it in a book. But what's come to you is the book and now you're reading X and you're trying to get to X. But what exactly does it mean? Well, now uh, you have to go back and forth with this text itself in order to figure out the meaning. And that's where you have um, uh, more significant questions about interpreting meaning arise, obviously. And uh, for Schleiermacher, who is, who is known um, as the father of hermeneutics. Now, hermeneutics existed before Schleiermacher, and, and Schleiermacher um, wasn't even in his generation the only person doing this. But he's the one who really um, uh, made the initial strides that got noticed um, in hermeneutics in the modern sense. Um, he is placed historically, uh, he is um, thinking and writing about hermeneutics in uh, the late uh, 1700s and the early 1800s. He is um, Protestant, he is a theologian, but also a philosopher. So he has interpreted Plato, but he's also interpreted the scriptures. And of course, with the scriptures, we're on the far side of the Reformation. So in the early church, there were very many different sorts of exegetical strategies, and you'll have, you'll have debates over um, you know, allegorical and metaphorical versus literal interpretations. Sort of the consensus view arose that, that, that and, and, and it never was finalized, um, and I'll explain why. But in terms of interpretation of scripture, you can look for a fourfold meaning of, of the text, the literal meaning, the allegorical meaning, the typological meaning, and um, the kind of the eschatological meaning, what, what, it, what it portends or what it anticipates. Um, and, and the reason they had that is that the early church said, well, there's some of these uh, writings, for instance, the creation accounts. They said, well, this is, these are obviously not literal creation accounts. The, the, the sun appears um, on day four after all this other sort of stuff has happened. Or I forget now the details, but um, that's probably not good. <laughs> probably have to cut that part too. Um, so the Genesis accounts, for instance, Augustine said, you know, if you take these literally as what happened, you don't understand what's going on in these accounts. There were many accounts that were in verses of scripture that were seen as either literally clearly false or morally clearly objectionable. And, and that was okay in the early church. What you just said is, well, this has a metaphorical meaning or this has a typological meaning and the literal and moral meaning here is, is not to be observed. So um, it surprises people sometimes today because they think that the modern notion of a literal interpretation is the ancient notion, the original notion, but that, that's just not the case. But who gets to decide when you make these various interpretations um, which one to use and how to understand these very complicated uh, texts? And the answer in the early church was, well, it's the community that decides. It's, it's the church itself which determines how to interpret these texts and what they mean. And there were church councils held about how to interpret key texts and how to relate them to doctrine, uh, but it was the church, uh, the church that had the uh, you know the apostolic uh, linkage to to Peter, which which represented the wisdom, the learned wisdom of the community. It was the the church, which was the authority in determining, as far as it could, how best to interpret scripture. Uh, and that doesn't mean that the church claimed to know how to perfectly interpret every scripture. Many debates were ongoing, but nonetheless, in terms of of central areas of doctrine, trinity, and um, 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 doctrine of uh, Christologies, uh, those sorts of things. The, do the, the church uh, was the authority uh, which grounded the interpretation of Scripture. 
Uh, meanwhile, if you were reading, for instance, um, you know, philosophy, Aristotle, or if you were reading literature or, or something like that, then you would have a different uh, sort of uh, uh, method for interpreting different sorts of authorities. Or if you were reading legal texts, you would read them according to legal precedents and, and the rules of how uh, laws in the various societies were structured and would be read and, and obeyed. In other words, there were regional... <clears throat> regional hermeneutics, regional theories of interpretation, which switched according to which text you were looking at. Um, this endured up till Schleiermacher's day, but what happened with the Reformation was, with its appeal to sola scriptura, but without any argument for, you know, exactly how do you determine, you know, what's the right reading of scripture, since scripture is, is susceptible to multiple interpretations, uh, once it went to Sola Scriptura and moved away from the authority of the Catholic Church, suddenly, and this was the Catholic Church's um, objection, it's it's the decision of the Church which authorizes Scripture, and more than that, you know, the meaning of Scripture. How do you appeal to Scripture apart from the Church? And, and that was a pretty reasonable thing to say. And they said, once you do that, then 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 Scripture can mean all sorts of things. Which is, of course, the, of course, precisely what happened in the Reformation, as the reformers split among, you know, Baptist, Anabaptist, uh, Reformed, Lutheran, um, you know, all sorts of different denominations and understandings of Scripture flourish, uh, because the the Church was removed as the authority. Uh, so by Schleiermacher's time, uh, you this had all matured. So you had a host of different ways of interpreting scripture. You had still the Catholic Church's authoritative way of interpreting scripture. And then you had all these other regional hermeneutics that, you know, if you were interpreting scripture, that was one thing. But if you were doing a, reading a science text, that was something else. If you were reading a legal text, that was something else. If you were reading a, a classics uh, text, uh, you know, uh, Greek or something like that, then all of these areas had their own rules, their own hermeneutics. Um, and Schleiermacher, as a philosopher uh, and a theologian, who was interested in the integrity of, of the church and its reading of scripture, found this situation tolerable. Um, and it was intolerable in terms of the, the text, the way people read text generally, whereas in the, the natural science, there was a unified uh, method. So, you know, you knew if you were doing chemistry or physics or um, it's a little uh, an anachronistic, but, but um, uh, biology um, or um, uh, um, uh, paleontology, you 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 know you saw all different things as significant. A chemist doesn't see a dinosaur, and a paleontologist doesn't see um, uh, um, um, atomic particles or whatever. But nonetheless, in all those sciences, they have basic they have a basic set of rules of basic reality and understanding of how reality is connected and what constitutes evidence and how you. You look at things. So it's not just random different scientific methods for different sciences. It's it's a single method, a single notion of causal continuance, and a single notion of how you give evidence and, and, and give explanations, which then you apply differently in the different uh, sciences. That was lacking in um, the spheres of, uh, of the sciences of the text of, of humanities. So Schleiermacher is looking for interpretation as a technology. That's why that's the first thing there. He, he wants some sort of method for interpretation. So no matter what you're interpreting, you're going to use the same method, and that method is going to allow you to discern uh, the meaning of the text. Um, let me start, go back one step here with a great quote from um, Ricoeur about this, um, about how the... the, the, the um, Uh, interpretation, the activity of discernment, uh, the, is properly called interpretation. It uh, consists in recognizing which relatively univocal message the speaker has constructed on the polysemic basis of the common lexicon. Um, the relatively um, uh, univocal is a sense, uh, you know, takes account of the fact that it's it's not an absolute identity of sense, right? So as a, um, if I say the word father, then depending on whether you are a father or are not a father, could ever be a father, um, would like to be a father but cannot be a father, uh, had a father who was absent or who died or who was abusive, um, 
because of your upbringing, when you hear the word father, you think first of a priest. Uh, and, and all those things combined in different ways, experience as a father, experience as a father's experience of being a father. When I say the word father, in, in terms of what everyone in the room is thinking, there are you know precisely um, as many different meanings as the room as there are uh, people hearing, uh, because all of our understanding of the father when I say that word, is conditioned by all the experiences associated with that word that we bring to the word. Even though no one thinks I'm talking about, um, you know, a, a potato when I talk about a father, right? So, so, so there's a narrowing in to the meaning, uh, but it, it's uh, this this uh, relatively univocal gives space for not saying for for not being so rigid that the second that every meaning isn't absolutely identical always lost right so if i say no no when i say father what i'm talking about in this context is a, a priest and in particular this priest in this day in this age where this was the understanding of what a priest was and how a father functioned then even though we'll still have different notions of father we will have narrowed in what i mean by father um, adequately enough that that's the sort of interpretation of uh, technology that Schleiermacher is looking for and in which uh, record discusses in terms of the um, uh, interpretation which consists in recognizing which relatively univocal so not just univocal but relatively univocal um, uh, message the speaker has constructed so see the, the speaker constructing a method um, um, uh, uh, based on, ba uh, on the polysemic basis, because the words aren't exactly the meaning, of the common lexicon. So nonetheless, we, we all participate in any language uh, group, we'll all participate in a relatively univocal um, uh, but polysemic um, lexicon. And so I, I, I have an idea, I bring it to discourse in the lexicon, I say it to try to communicate to you, we're right back with that um, drawing. Now, um, uh, so uh, um, Schleiermacher, in, in, in his interest, is, is um, interested in constructing uh, hermeneutics as a technology, so there's some authority for interpretation of all texts, um, including, and significantly for him, uh, biblical and theological texts. Now, um, <clears throat> this is a, a raising exegesis and philology to the level of a kunstlier, that is a technology uh, which is not a mere connection, collection of unconnected um, operations. Um, the, um, Now, in this next paragraph, he, he interestingly uh, goes a, a, astray um, and talking about something that hadn't occurred to Schleiermacher, uh, but which was perceived, he says, by Herder and Kassirer, who are uh, later, and Kassirer is a 20th century uh, philosopher, and that is in a critical philosophy, and this is a reference now to the philosophy of Kant, to the critique of pure reason, um, to uh, the continuation of the ambition of being able to say how we can have um, technically a priori synthetic judgments, which we know to be uh, completely true without any doubt. Um, in other words, how can we have universal um, objective knowledge? How, how are we capable of that? And delineating um, how that's possible. That's critical in the modern sense, the sense of epistemology as first philosophy where the most important thing is to know what you know and know what you don't know and where knowledge is indexed to not even possibility of logical doubt um, this is this is what really Descartes famous I think therefore I am uh, represents uh, Descartes asks what can't I doubt and he, he, he suspects even an evil demon it's possible there's an evil, evil demon perceiving him about his own body and his surroundings. And nowadays you think that more of a, of a brain and a, a vat of some alien super scientist that's actually feeding in um, all the data. 
um, you could think of the, the, the background of the Matrix um, premise where there's, everyone's actually a body um, being used as batteries or something. Uh, but everything that's going on, the world they live in, is just generated by inputs into their brain. And that becomes the world. So, so Descartes does that with the evil demons. Who's deceived, and he says, well, look, there's one thing the demon can't deceive me of is no matter what else I'm deceived about, I am. I am. I am existing as a thinking thing. Um, and, and so I think, therefore I am. And then he adds to that, um, because of the character of his thoughts, an argument for the existence of God, which says there's no evil demon, I must be able to, to uh, trust uh, my perceptions and, the other thing. And, then, and then tries to build knowledge from that you know, Archimedean point of absolute certainty, then constructing an argument for God, which, by the way, no one finds convincing. And so what, what, you, what you get is, though, that standard of what knowledge is, as absolute, certain, objective, and universal, even though uh, Descartes, uh, the rest of Descartes' philosophy kind of falls away, that, that standard for knowledge endures as, as, and, and is known as, as epistemology as first philosophy in modern Western philosophy. And, and that has endured um, really still to this day, especially in Anglophone uh, philosophy, and, and was powerful up through the 1980s and, and, and 1990s even, um, and, and beyond in some of the sciences. The, what undercuts that epistemology as first philosophy and that ambition is precisely the developments in hermeneutics we'll be studying in this course. Um, so, but, but to note here, there's no link between physics and ethics. Now that is going to be massively significant, and the, the, that's the real, um, that is the truly momentous thing that happened with the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, so-called enlightenment is, is it, it, it created a world, an understanding of the character of the world, a cosmology in which physics, and that way of thinking, everything that's natural. So for a lot of people, simply everything that is has no connection uh, to ethics. Whereas in the medieval Ptolemaic and all the earlier cosmologies of the mainstream Western tradition, I mean, the, the, it's not an accident we reach back to we talk about Adams and Democritus because because this modern philosophy, uh, where where it's just sheer happening, there's no uh, the, the the universe has no ethical uh, contour itself, right? It's just what's natural is a brute happening, following in accord with causal kind of a causal flux. Maybe if we can even make sense of the idea uh, with some indeterminacy coming in, but in terms of 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 the state of the flux from the prior moments to future moments, it's that causal, it's all those causal interactions, interactions perhaps with some degree of indeterminacy, that is what's really going on. Uh, there is nothing in that which is inherently um, ethical or moral. So the natural world is an amoral world, and science investigates it uh, without any moral ca categories. And, and, and so that's the momentous divide, and it will continue to haunt us at the end of all of this as well. And, and, and that's where I'm going to bring in Levinas because he's the one who really sees this uh, in the most penetrating uh, way. We're going to see Habermas and Gadamer both in different ways try to get that ethical back and, and do it within the confines of modern understanding. Now where the world has no inherent moral dimension, but, but nonetheless they uh, need to be able to articulate some sort of a moral uh, strong moral um, understanding. And, and this is, again, this is not just some abstract theory. It's because both of them in this work in hermeneutics, which is you know being thought through in these ways in the 40s and 50s and then comes to fruition in, in Gadamer's Truth and Method, that's the kind of uh, locus classicus for uh, hermeneutics in the 60s, um, th that they're in Germany, um, um, Habermas and Gadamer, right after the Holocaust. So for both of them, it's unthinkable uh, to have a theory which cannot say the Holocaust was evil and, and should not have happened. The National Socialists were, were wrong. The Nazis were wrong. Um, on the other hand, because of the way they're constrained within modern parameters where physics and ethics have been split, there, there, there's no connection between physics and ethics, between the natural world and ethical reality, um, 
we're going to see them flail in, in their attempts uh, to deal with that. But, but this is what motivates them. In particular, we're going to see this, well, it's what motivates both of them in different ways. It's a very strong uh, motivation. Okay, so, so I've, I've gone ahead, but we've done enough work that I think uh, maybe you understand this. You've heard me say it before. Um, you, you, we'll begin to gather this. Um, but, but that's the big, the big thing. Let me go back to Schleiermacher now. That's the big thing. That, that was vague, right? So the inability to generate a moral understanding um, 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 in the wake of the Holocaust within the confines of the predominant streams of modern Western rationality um, where the natural world is now completely split, split from physics that's the conundrum, that's the issue, which is at the heart um, of, of the, the questioning and, 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 and work that both Gadamer and, and Habermas are engaging. Okay, I want to just clarify that's what I meant by that. Okay, all right, now, um, so to finish, let me just do, if I read this, it'll be nice and tight, but it's going to be long. So let me instead just work off of the um, outline, the expanded outline, which, which I've simply made by trying to um, say, um, um, pick out key terms and put them into a dialogue. So the desire of an interpretation of a technology, uh, and by that is science, technology in the modern sense. This gets a little tricky because uh, the technical you see down below um, is techne more in, and, and kunst actually is, is an overlap here too, but techne more in the Greek sense of art. Whereas when we say technical, what we mean is typically more mechanical. Whereas when Schleiermacher says technical there, he's thinking more in the Greek sense of techne, which means art. And that's why it's helpful to think of technical right away in the psychological uh, sense. So uh, Schleiermacher, um, uh, Ricoeur says, I think rightly, uh, he's both, uh, there's two trajectories uh, which mark him. One is the romantic trajectory which looks to celebrate uh, the genius of the individual author um, and, and what the great poet or the great um, uh, philosopher or writer or painter, or whatever, the, the, the genius of the truths that they make manifest. Um, and, on, and, and that's the genius of the individual artist. And on the other side is the critical, which is a reference to Kant's critique of pure reason. And this, all of this that I was just talking about in terms of epistemology is first philosophy. Where what you're looking for are objective, dispassionate uh, reasons and dynamics. And, and you get something which is scientific to the degree you get something which is um, you know, about the relating relationships of kinds. Um, and, and about us insofar as we are kinds and, and, um, and, and fit into categories which can be then explained um, in, in ways that are, are universally valid and objective and dispa dispa dispassionate, not in any way prejudiced. So these two, uh, the romantic and the critical, are, are at tension with each other because the critical is going to give you at best a type an ideal type of form uh, where what you are is a product of um, and how we're identified is as a product of these other uh, sorts of things and then we become a type. So the, the genius of the romantic and the individuality of the romantic and the, the kind of the um, poetry of, of the meaning of what the romantic is saying, uh, that can't be captured by the critical because the critical will only be able to give you a type where the, the romantic wants to say they're appealing to something which is um, not just a novel development of types interacting in certain ways, but somehow the function of, 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 of the individual genius um, of the poet or the painter or the musician or the author as they connect us to um, um, uh, these deep truths and realities through their genius. So these two are at, at loggerheads. And, and that, those loggerheads are reflected in this grammatical, objective, negative, in the technical, psychological, um, subjectivity, positive, of the next two lines. And so the romantic, um, and, and, and I don't know, the, the romantic goes with the technical, and the critical goes with the line right below it, the, the grammatical. 
Because what does the grammar give you? You, you? As you hear me talk, you you know by the meaning of words and the way they're associated. In other words, by the grammar, you, you, you're you able to narrow down what I mean. Um, and so uh, in that sense, when you use grammar to discern my meaning, you're not discerning a meaning that's unique or special or a product of creative genius of mine. You are understanding uh, me in, in terms of our common lectionary. There is... There is, there are, it's polyvalent. Let me use that word. I like it better than policy. It's polyvalent. The same words can have multiple meanings and connotations. And to some degree, our understanding, because our context is shifting, will never be exact. But nonetheless, what the grammatical gets you and how it works is to get you to what, how the, the rules and the meanings and of, of, of language work. And that's what allows you to narrow and to figure out, okay, this is what he's talking about, not this, that, or the other. But that this is going to be a product of knowing these rules so in that sense that's the second thing it's objective knowledge it's 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 objective because it's not something that's indexed to my particular subjectivity it's indexed to the way language works and so i've taken a discourse i've, I've put my thought into words and insofar as they're words and i've associated them in certain ways i've taken advantage of the of the grant grammar um and this is negative not and this is not a moral judgment here, right? So you don't understand negative as an ethical or moral thing here. It's negative in the sense that it allows you to narrow in on my meaning in um, in accord with universal rules and and uh, and how the language works, the grammar. So you're getting my meaning as a, a production of a type. But, and this is why it's only negative if you also have the romantic in you, it's also ne it's negative because while it narrows things down, it never gets just because it's operating at the, at the at the level of forms and types to the unique creative genius of a particular utterance, right? Now, of course, if I'm giving you if I'm explaining to you how to change a tire, then there's not much negative here because there's not much creative genius in that sort of thing. So, so we're not talking about every sort of speech you might be talking about, but when it comes to the arts, when it comes to um, existential sorts of reflections of the great poets, the the, the where the where you're transported to by the great musicians, the artworks, um, and, and and poetry, where the, the genius of the author is to unveil something creative and new, right? Which is not just a product of the forms that are being used. Although the forms are being utilized, they're being utilized to help you come to a new understanding, which is not just a straightforward. Uh, um, a product of the forms. So in that sense, it's art. That's the technical in that second sense. And it's psychological. That helps us get it kind of the subjectivity in uh, that, that it's about. So it's not about me insofar as I'm a form and a type and a product of prior causal streams, genetic and linguistic. It's the way in which somehow I transcend all of that and I use the words, but I use it to generate some creative new idea that gives you the positive meaning, which is the meaning of what I mean by it uniquely in that genius. So that's where the grammatical gives you the objective, but it's negative because it doesn't get you to the genius. So that's part of the critical, the, 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 the critical in the sense of Kant's critique and uh, epistemology is first philosophy. On the other side is the romantic, which is the, the more the psychological, which gets you the unique subjectivity, the genius of the author, and that's positive because that gets you actually to the meaning of the author um, that, uh, that they're saying. Now, in later work, um, and, and we uh, in class detailed this at a level of precision, which I don't think I can replicate here off the top of my head. Maybe I should, I'm, what I'm going to do is pause and take a look and see if I can bring back uh, the distinction. Because divination comparison, um, it's easy to parallel that to romantic and critical and grammatical and technical. But I actually think divination comparison happens within the realm of the technical but it, with a sort of a grammatical element to it so maybe that maybe i will go with that because we're close uh, and i will do it so divination is the fact that you know so we talk about that it can only get you the, and then you have the positive right they actually what it means which is more than just a combination of the rules and the grammar but but how do I get there once there's no rules in grammar? And, and the answer is this kind of act of divination, which is supposed to sound almost as magical as it is, because it is kind of this 
leap beyond what just the forms, the types, the the mechanistic sort of understandings of the grammatical can get you to to the unique genius of that person. So there's this kind of leap beyond uh, forms. That's the divination. And how do you do that? Well, I think I think what he's doing is he's thinking of comparison, where you compare. So this is where I don't think it's quite grammatical, but you compare like life experiences. And it's that reality, which, you, which, and this goes with the romantic, because the idea with the romantic is not, it's just their individual genius. That emphasis comes later. But that the romantic is ma manifesting the elan vital, the, the vital living elements of life, which are, which are deep um, within reality, which the romantic poet or author, it's, it's their gift to, to help bring these to uh, your knowledge. And so when it comes to these existential things, like, you know, knowing it, it is to find out, um, you know, to get the cancer diagnosis, to lose um, a child, um, to, uh, to, to, um, to have a child, to have that joy, uh, to be in, in, uh, in love, um, to have one's love spurned from the beloved. All these sorts of things where, where what the poet does is, is, is it puts it in this unique way. But then, you know, you read this poem about grief and you're like, wait, that's it. That's what I'm experiencing. Uh, somehow they've made, put into words something which for me was just amorphous. And it's the comparison of the poet and their experience of grief and their ability to do it. And my experience of grief, that's the comparison which allows me to divine the meaning, which is beyond the words. The words always fall short. But nonetheless, something we both have experienced is as 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 we participated as living being in the Elan Vital. Um so 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 I think that's the divination comparison. In the end here though, his his ambition though is still a rule. And and so that doesn't get you to the technology. You have this 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 something that escapes that technology in this in comparison. So that's the aporia that um Ricor thinks that Schleiermacher is left with as as do some others. But but recoursing in that, that's the aporia. And the aporia is a gap where things can't quite get together in your thought. Where you have rules, and the rules give you the technology, so they give you the rules. But in the end, what you want is genius, and the rules can't get you there. So the aporia is rules, but genius. So he doesn't get these two together. Um, but he does make the first steps in having us think about uh, technology of interpretation. So what I just did, what I just applied to you, you know, you might look at, 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 at different texts differently, uh, even within, like, say, scripture. Some texts are more historical, some texts are more poetic, some, you know, you'll, you'll still sort texts according to their genres, but now more like science, right, where you're doing chemistry, where you're doing physics, or you're doing biology. So you know you're doing different things, but, but the basic background scientific method is in play. Now, no matter, you know, you're going to recognize the different genres, but the same sorts of methods are in play. Uh, and that, that means that already, and, and he knows this through interpreting Plato, um, as, as well as looking at scripture, you're going to have to attend to language. You're going to have to attend, uh, attend to the original context. You're going to have to uh, attend to the original, not just context of the text, but the social context of the author. Um, all these sorts of things that you have to do, uh, that we've learned to do um, uh, in order to understand distant texts, and not just to read them in our own time, but to put them in their own time so we can understand these are the rules um, that Schleiermacher uh, put into play. Um, and, and this will give birth in, in Germany in particular to modern um, uh, biblical criticism and exegesis, because suddenly these same rules that have been used for Aristotle and Plato and these other texts in accord with their genre are now going to be applied to the biblical text uh, in an attempt to see, you know, what is the real meaning uh, that the authors were driving to in these texts, and, and how do we do the work with the language, with the context, with the contemporary forms, to do as much as we can to objectively discern what the text means, and to get that authoritative meaning. Okay, I think I'll stop there. There's much left to be said, but I'm going to use that already very long um, run for the end of my stuff on Schleiermacher.